<laughs> Hi. <laughs> okay, so um, actually, so before I begin this talk, um, there, Stein, yes. Um, we're gonna have two toasts tonight because I'd like to dedicate this talk to uh, a friend of mine who's passed away, a guy named Fraggle. Uh, seriously, the most Fraggle, a lot of people who know him, uh, knew him, he is definitely hands down the most authoritative person I'll ever meet about the subject I'm about to talk about. So here's a Fraggle. Right, so um, when you think of discoveries that have happened, helped shape civilization, you think of things like, well, I mean, a lot of talks that we've had so far about, you know, under, undersea worms and like lost cities and like, you know, all sorts of other manner of important discoveries. A lot of people don't really consider like things like beer, right? Beer, right? Beer is regarded as the oldest beverage in recorded history. Um, it's the third most popular drink right after tea and water. <laughs> it dates uh, back to as early as 35 BC in Mesopotamia, but uh, early indications it could actually have been even older than that, maybe as old as like 7,000 BC in China. There are some indications of that. Uh, there's records of it definitely being used being in Sumer, uh, which is now modern Iraq. Uh, but how did it first come about and how did it affect uh, have its effects on civilizations as uh, that are yet to come. So, important question here is like, what exactly is beer? Um, it's the result of brewing of grain cereals, wheat, rye, corn, uh, rice in some instances, and water. Uh, during the brewing process, fermentation occurs, uh, which produces, amongst other things, sugars in the form of maltose. Uh, the yeast that form uh, eat away at the sugars, uh, which then produces ethanol, alcohol, and also carbonation. So as byproducts, as, as byproducts. So it should be also noted that early beers uh, didn't use hops, uh, which came actually much later. Like, uh, but however, a lot of these uh, herbs, a lot of herbs that were added as flavors and such, uh, are kind of mentioned up here. Right. I mean, some of these are really weird too, like, like caraway. I'm like, oh, now I want to try that. Um, there is no recorded history as to exactly who or when beer was first created, but it's generally accepted that it quite possibly might have predated uh, recorded history. Uh, in all likelihood, beer was created accidentally by soaking cereal grains in water to help loosen the outer shells uh, and making the nutrients inside easier to eat. Uh, you can add heat to that eventually, and the brewing process was sped up, resulting in a gruel-like substance, which was also very alcoholic. Right? Right? Seriously. I kind of, I really want to try this now, just to experiment with this. But um, so pictured here, you can see how uh, ancient Sumerians uh, likely drank the stuff. Um, but and it's also accepted that they created straws, right? Sumerians created straws to get to the liquid underneath the thick gruel floating on the surface of, of this foul liquid, but, but potent. Um, there is some evidence that indicate that beer, uh, uh, per, beer predates bread. Uh, and it's extremely possible that beer was developed at first in experiments in, uh, in attempts to create bread. So Sumerians and other uh, uh, early cultures valued this stuff tremendously. Um, it's, in this document that's pictured here, uh, you can see that it's from around 3100 uh, 3, BC. Uh, it's written in cuneiform. Uh, we have what's described at, uh, at this, uh, this is basically a receipt for like the best beer in the, in the city of Ur. Uh, it was apparently made by this guy named Alulu, uh, who apparently, like, you hear, he, he sold the best beer in the city. And it's like, this is, this is a proof of it. Um, this is, it should also be noted, this, this tablet is the only known uh, surviving document from the city of Ur of this per time period. Right? Uh, so not only did, uh, did beer provide a good uh, reason to trek 200 miles to another city for, uh, to conduct trades, but also it was an ultra portable food source and, uh, and a source of nutrients. Uh, grains and cereals generally are much easier to grow and generally, uh, you know, then maintain and such than like fruits and vegetables and livestock. Um, last but also kind of important, I mean, uh, the creation of beer oftentimes made impure water potable, right? So, so it made, made it safe to consume. So, in fact, without beer culture, uh, beer culture as we know it, uh, probably would have wouldn't have advanced as fast as it did when it did. Um, the discovery of beer affected all aspects of life. It was a major reason for early humans to go from being hunter-gatherers to settling down to agrarian societies. Um, so pictured here is the, uh, a portion of the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is uh, the first known tale of civilization uh, and details the story of the epic hero Enkidu, uh, who becomes civilized once he's taught to drink beer. <laughs> right? Uh, 
this was done in uh, and re in a religious setting, of course, because religion was you know totally married to um, everything, everything, um, and the beverage was when the beverage first discovered. Um, later on, the, the famous poem, the hymn to Ninkasi, uh, was a recipe for ancient beer. Uh, Ninkasi was the ancient Sumerian goddess of, of beer, and it was actually noted as like being the physical manifestation of beer. And it was thought that you actually uh, she transferred her in, in herself into you when you drank beer uh, from her recipe, right? You become one with beer. Uh, the Egyptians, right, altered uh, the Sumerian brewing methods to create a smoother, lighter brew, which could be poured into a cup or glass for consumption. So. Yeah, actually, yeah, it wasn't too far from that. Uh, Egyptian beer, therefore, is often uh, cited as the first beer um, in the world because it was had more in common with what you normally identify as beer. Um, but it still, I mean, even that wasn't close to like what we drink today. It's, it was, I mean, it was, it, it didn't have the giant, you know, thick gruel on top, but it was still not exactly beer as we know it. Um, right. Um, it, 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 a lot of people know that. Uh, uh, the ancient workers at Giza, uh, who built the pyramids, uh, were given beer. This is true. Um, they were actually were given beer rations of three times a day. Um, it's also believed that the uh, women were in charge of the brewing process and responsible for beer production. Right? Uh, beer! Um, uh, like Sumerians, uh, beer also played a part in their religion. So, in the tale of the destruction of mankind, the great god Ra uh, grew tired of humanity's bullshit and decided uh, to destroy everyone on the planet. Uh, he, he unleashed Sekhmet to go on a genocidal killing spree, uh, tearing people apart and drinking their blood. Um, so the other gods were like, wait a minute, Ra, you, you need to kind of like settle down here, because like if Sekhmet persists, there's no one left, there will be no one left to, you know, sac you know, provide sacrifices, and I mean, who are really teaching this lesson to any, they're teaching this lesson to anyways if there's no one, you know, around, right? So Ra's like, okay, yeah, you're right. Um, okay, tried calling Sekhmet back, but she was consumed with this bloodlust, didn't want to like have anything a part of it. So Ra came up with this good idea. He came, he made this big giant bowl of beer, dyed it red, and uh, put it in front of Sekhmet's path. Uh, the goddess finds the beer, thinks it's blood, drinks it, becomes totally drunk, falls asleep, and wakes up as the goddess Hathor, in, uh, which is kind and gentle to and uh, kind and gentle friend of humanity. <laughs> True story. Uh, Beer even played a part in the ancient games in ancient games and entertainment. Uh, evidence shows that uh, beer may have been a major factor in ancient uh, Greek civilizations. Uh, the ancient uh, so archaeologists have found in ancient Greek cities um, thousands of grains of cereal date to around like 2100 BC. Um, they played this popular game called uh, Kotobos, which is essentially early beer pong. Um, <laughs> Yeah, they would, they would, they had this large bowl or a bucket, and they would have smaller little floating bowls inside of it, and the players would sit around and throw little, like, heavy things into the smaller bowls to try and sink them, and yay, when you drink. <laughs> um, beer uh, has, in, in history, has, has proven to save lives. It's true. Uh, during an outbreak of the plague in 16, uh, 612 uh, AD in Germany, uh, there was a monk named Arnold of Metz uh, who established a monastery in Odenburg, uh, he persuaded his, his parish to drink beer in place of water, which was contaminated with the plague. He didn't know this, but he was like, his whole, his whole notion was that, um, what was it? Uh, from man's sweat to God's love, beer came into the world. And so, and it, you know, a lot of people just drank the beer instead of the water, and it saved lives, apparently. Um, St. Arnold, to this day, is still revered as the patron saint of brewers. Uh, beer has affected vocabulary uh, in various ways throughout history. Uh, so the adjective bridal, Actually, for instance, it derives from the Anglo-Saxon noun of bride ale. Originally, a bride ale was the drink given out at weddings, uh, oftentimes uh, produced by the family of the bride. Um, there was there were strict laws, by the way, about how much could be made, and, and you know, based on how many people were at the wedding. And yeah, um, there of course have been beer tragedies in history. Um, most people know about the effects of prohibition in the U.S. and what it had there. But do you know about the Great London Beer Flood of 1814? Yeah. You do? Oh, okay, great. This, this is going to be easy. So in, in October 17th, um, um, in the St. Giles Parish of London, uh, the Muse and Company's uh, brewery had a fatal accident. 323,000 imperial gallons of beer exploded out of the building after one of the vats collapsed, causing a domino effect and creating a lethal flood of beer that spilled out onto the streets. The flood broke through the, the walls of the brewery and also broke through the walls of the Tavishock Arms pub nearby, 
swamped nearby Georgian New Streets and flooded a, a room where there was a wake happening. You're right, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Certain irony there. Um, uh, eight people were killed. Uh, many more were injured. Um, actually, no charges were made against the brewery, um, as it was, the courts ruled it as an act of God. Uh, however, the scandal was enough to end the business over a period of time, and the brewery was eventually demolished in 1922. And as in closing, let's not forget the overlooked beer's importance during war. Right. So during, during World War II, right after the invasion of Normandy and France, the Allied front, uh, front line troops were critically short of beer. I mean, there was this huge morale issue, and, and right, yeah, no beer. And as a result, in conjunction with the RAF, uh, bootleggers became known as sorcerers, um, sprang up with an, uh, an idea to get beer to the front line troops. They would clean out these, um, these fuel tanks, these, uh, these the fuel tanks that could be jettisoned, um, you know, clean them out entirely, fill them up with pale ale, fitted them to the bottom of Spitfires, and these planes would, would fly to the front lines of in, uh, these troops in Normandy, reaching the heights of about 15,000 feet. So the beer was really cold by the time they landed, <laughs> drop off the tanks, and fly back and do this, and this happened for years. And so one, one report um, had that one Spitfire landed on a runway, um, and no one was there to receive it. And they found out that the reason why is because these Germans had uh, taken a roost in this uh, uh, near, nearby clock tower and just shooting anyone nearby. So everyone was like, go, 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 go. So they dropped the beer and just the plane took off before getting shot down. Um, the alterations made to the jettison of these, uh, these tanks uh, eventually gave, uh, was even given an official designation, Modification XXX. Um, <laughs> Uh, however, one night, uh, one, as one might expect, the tanks that formerly held uh, the aviation fuel tainted the taste of the beer, so it was kind of metallic tasting and wasn't that great. However, uh, unreprising Royal Air Force uh, personnel also modified the Spitfire bombs, uh, bottom racks, to fit actually barrels to the bottom of the wings. So the aircraft would cruise uh, through the sky with a barrel attached to each, either side of the fuselage. So, um, so I'd like to end this talk uh, with a quote from Martin Luther. Um, there's a lot of quotes, but this, this, one, this one resonated with me. Um, Whoever drinks beer, he is quick to sleep. Whoever sleeps long does not sin. Whoever does not sin enters heaven. Thus, let us drink beer. Thank you. All right, thank you, Egan, for that uh, enlightening talk. That was great. I, I didn't know about the beer flood in London. I know, it makes me sad. But now that I know, knowing is half the battle. I um, want to thank, uh, once again, I want to thank uh, uh, Public Works for hosting us tonight. Everyone give them a round of applause. And I want to thank all of our volunteers again. Uh, there's so many of you. This is, th th this is really a community effort, and, and we love that uh, all of you participate. We love that all of you in the audience are part of us. Uh, we love that you guys up on the balcony have also uh, uh, been here. I can't see any of you. These lights are brutal. Um, but I know you're there, because when I'm sitting there, I can see you. Um, I know you exist. All right, next up. Um, we've got, uh, we'll be back on May 7th for stories of spite. We've got six tales of ill will and bad blood, pernicious maliciousness and rancorous intent, and the festering resentment that inspires vengeance, curated by Marcy Bennett. Yeah. Go, Marcy. If you have an idea for a spiteful story, submit it now to oddsalon.com slash speak. And of course, discounted tickets uh, in advance are for sale at the merch table, right meow. Um, once again, if you're inspired by our talks, you know where to go, oddsalon.com slash speak. Be sure to join our email list to keep up with, odd, with upcoming salons and speaker news, uh, including uh, 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 when you can join us for our membership excursions. Uh, between salons, you can find us online as well, and all the usual places, the Twippers, the Grams, the Facebooks at Odd Salon. And again, please, please, please consider joining us as a member, as part of our Patreon community, or as a sponsor of a salon. If your uh, uh, place of employment has far more money than the rest of us, please convince them to give it to us, because we'd like it. 
Um, members and patrons, remember, uh, both enjoy a host of insider benefits from ticket discounts to more odd stories from odd salon speakers and fellows. Uh, you can go online for more info. Inquire at the merch table for details. They'll be there for a few minutes after we wrap up. Uh, and remember to join our Facebook group, Something Weird, where we're going to be posting follow-up follow reading lists uh, and links related to tonight's talks. And we welcome you to join us and share stories and inspirations there as well. Uh, thank you, Public Works. Thank you, speakers. You guys really just... You did me... You did me... You made this really easy. You did... Uh-oh. This old has got stuff. I, ha I have one more thank you. I'd like to thank Seth for being our amazing curator tonight. This was his first time curating, and it is a ton of work. And we, uh, we compensate our speakers in drink and book, so we are compensating our curator with drink and books and a uh, themed Wolper Tinger from tonight and a very special you have earned our curator pin. Woo! So again, please give it up for Seth. Thank you so much for wrangling all the cats tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Isolda. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Oh, they want to see the books. Okay, books. Show you want to see my books, baby, huh? Okay. Uh, this is the speaker's book, which I selected for our speakers tonight. Uh, the Age of Gold, H.W. Brands. Most of it is excellent. He does sort of leave off a lot of the shitty things that John Sutter did, uh, but you've got my invocation to remind you about how horrible that shit was. The rest is fascinating. It's a great read. Uh, and this book is Simon Winchester, the map that was not on fire that changed the world. So... Thank you, everybody, for this. This is, this is an incredible thing. Thank you all for coming. Good night.